Coming up on this episode of Belief Hole. I mean, it really brings it home when you're seeing gunfire in the desert. You're hearing over the radio voices coming in yelling at clear Afghani accents about demons. And you're hearing gunshots. And then naturally you go up to check and absolutely nothing there. There should have been hundreds of shell casings in that room. The more you look into the stuff, you find that it seems to be the case that there are entities that are drawn to this dark energy. We've talked about the fear eaters, the nightmare feeders. They're drawn to centuries old battlegrounds, you know, with constant war. And that fear and tragedy that might be injected in that area, that might allow something to linger there for decades or centuries to come, maybe sleeping beneath the sand until a new conflict brings new food. New food. It's interesting because they seem to have this dual modus operandi where they're they're like human, they're a race, a living race, but there's also the supernatural aspect, maybe just because they have these extra abilities, mm-hmm. like possession, moving between realms. But in reality, they're mortal, they have families, they have free will. It's really strange. It's interesting. We could almost be considered maybe a, a livestock to them potentially, or a... Uh, That's what I think. Yeah. I definitely think humans on some level are being used sort of like cattle, like cattle. In some of the stories that we've heard, you can see them sometimes almost sliding as shadows across the rocks. Really creepy, interesting descriptions. But they say that the eyes don't change. The eyes they can't quite get right. Again, that's with so many supernatural things in general. Yeah. Freaky stuff. Freaky stuff. Freaky stuff. It seems to be the case that the more you study Jin, the more they look at you. Oh, I heard and that. And they see you and they say, oh, hello. <gasps> you recognize us now. We get, You give us energy. They're coming for you, John. Uh uh-uh. They're coming for you now. No, they're not interested in me. Because you eat liver meat. Let's leave the organ meats out of this, okay? <laughs> Jeremy, you love pulling all the darkness into my house. Sorry, I just find it fascinating. Yeah, you get to go home. <laughs> Conspiracy. Synchronicity. Sasquatch. Homunculus. Alien races. Satanism in Hollywood. MK. Tartaria. There's like a whole. I've been watching this one guy. Close the door, in. Jury. Close your door. What's the uh, inner earth disagreements? Ghost dad. <laughs> I like that movie. Dogman. Bohemian Grove. Corey Feldman. Magicians are demons. Specters. Spirits. Spirit sleep paralysis. Strange disappearances. Sky whale phenomena. Yes. Alternative history. Shadow people. Shh, quiet. I'm trying to say words with the mouth. It's getting dicey out there. Poltergeists. Oh, that's cool. Anunnaki. What is the moon? <laughs> Elf Towers. I would never talk about it. That's old. Y2K. Cover-ups. Apocalyptic. Catastrophe. Vampire. Vampire. I quit. <laughs> <laughs> Always a strong start, John. Well, hello, hello. Well, hello, hello. I'm John. I'm Jeremy. And I'm Chris, and today we've got a pretty kick-ass episode, right, here. That's absolutely correct. Uh, this is a topic that I've been wanting to do for a long time. Yeah. See, what had happened was... Nope, don't do that. I can't say that? I mean, you can. See, what happened was... I wanted to cover this topic that I've been running into. We have a friend who listens to the show. We're going to be talking about her story, her brother's story. But it's this theme of paranormal experiences, supernatural occurrences happening at at war. Right. On the battlefield or in that kind of atmosphere. And when you're thinking about supernatural occurrences at war, paranormal experiences, we're seeing the military theater, if you will, obviously in our lifetime has been the Middle East. And what's interesting about that is you're hearing soldiers absorbing, witnessing, experiencing this kind of supernatural paranormal phenomena from the lens of an American, right? And culturally specific phenomena, right? That's kind of the idea. Yeah. And so I just found that concept fascinating. So of course this leads to the jinn. We've had a lot of requests for jinn too. Covering jinn, going deep into what are jinn, how are they different from genies? Exactly. Are they real? Before we get into all that, They are a supernatural concept. Of course, they tie into the Muslim religion, uh, but they predate Islam, which is interesting. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Something like the genie or the jinn have been around for a long time. And so we're going to get into that shortly here. Would it be fair to say that they are equivalent to demons in Christianity? See, that is a great question. And I knew that was going to come up first. Uh, (laughs) They are not. Um, No? they, They have unique characteristics that make them separate. Although there is overlap in the mythology, if you want to call it that, or the biblical history of, for example, Solomon, which I'm sure Jim will get into a little bit later, but where 
in the Islamic faith, it's the jinn that he gains control over who he commands to help him build this temple. But in the Christian faith, it's a demon. So if you've heard the term Solomonic magic, right? Sounds familiar. So according to the Bible, God gave Solomon the ability to communicate with animals and demons. And I'm actually not totally sure if in the biblical, the Old Testament version, if God gives Solomon this power or Solomon does it on his own. I think he's gifted it. I know in the Quran, he's gifted the ability to communicate with animals and jinn. But they are distinct things in the Quran versus the Bible. But we'll get into that story because it's really interesting. Yeah. And I just want to say one thing. It's really fascinating because, I mean, obviously Jeremy focused on this episode. I'm doing the expansion. But the little bit that I did look into the jinn, I never realized reading about it, it sounds so similar to faith folk and elvish folklore and hidden folk. We're in a way where the jinn is a race alongside mankind that was created first, but lives alongside us, lives lives, drives cars, has jobs. Uh, they have access to the non-physical and the physical and just live in a dimension kind of right alongside ours, just like hidden folk in a way. So to me, it almost sounds like if you want to believe that these things are happening and it's just interesting that it's a global phenomenon under different names, obviously differences between faith folk and jinn, but, and you'll get into that, but I just thought it strikes a chord of similarity there between the two phenomena. Yeah, there's definitely, I mean, when we get into the description of jinn, there's obvious overlap between fairy lore the unseen, those entities that live beyond us in a parallel reality. So I was reading this guy who was a Muslim who described the world as basically, and we will hear this in Christianity, but also in the paranormal world, you hear this all the time. And of course they pull from these sources, but the veil, the way this guy described it was Allah gave the veil to mankind to put over their eyes, lest they go insane from the magnitude of what they would see if that filter had been removed. That's fascinating. Other worlds, uh, parallel planes, entities, energies, and this is where the jinn live. They are granted a world alongside us. We can't see them, but they can see us and they can interact with us. That's interesting. It sounds a lot like a lot of the stuff we cover on the show. It sounds like an unfair advantage that they have. It absolutely is. <laughs> um, okay, one more question. Yep. So are the jinn everywhere or just in the Middle East? That is a wonderful yeah, question. I love that question. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking the same thing because it, to me, it's like, and I'm sure you'll have some responses to that chair, but the concept is really interesting to me. You know, like, let's say there's credence to, there is a parallel reality, a dimension that's just alongside ours where another race exists, jinn or hidden folk in some places. But what if they're also just as separated by the, maybe the geography of earth is the one common denominator between all these different realms. And so they, just like us, have different cultures in different parts. So different sort of demonic or demonic figures or hidden folk in different regions because they evolved as a culture separately, just like we did with the same sort of, I mean- This would be your kind of theory. It's just kind of an interesting idea. Yeah. Of course, jinn can fly, so they could probably travel quicker to other places. The jinn, okay, before, actually, before I say this, I want to say I'm not a scholar, definitely not a theologian, so anyone who might, a little might yourself. be like, oh, these guys don't know what they're talking about. That's true. I researched for this episode and I found some really interesting <laughs> stories. <laughs> I found a lot of interesting uh, evidence and different perspectives that I'm putting together, pulling from different sources to try to give everyone an understanding who, like me, had no real right. depth of knowledge this in this field. This is a deep area of study, right? It is. So just wanted to clarify that because there's even within the Islamic communities, you know, you have the Islamic religion versus the folklore of that area. Um the point is there's a lot of different perspectives, I would say. So within these schools of thought, and I think this is across the board, is that jinn are the oldest thing here. They existed before Adam. 2,000 years before Adam, they lived as a race on the earth. So they had their they're own- physical? In their dimension, in they're their physical. kind of alongside us. Okay, so they didn't change. I don't think so. I think that they were always in this other plane that we exist next to. Well, what do you know, Jeremy? I'm figuring that out as I go here. Uh, <laughs> But I'm glad you asked that question because that is that is a good point. Uh, what you said, I think, is right, though. The aspect of their mythology that they were here thousands of years before man yeah. reminds me of the Archons. Yes. It's interesting. There's a book that I really want to get by Rosemary Ellen Guiley. Yeah. Rest in peace. But she likened them to, she was kind of doing this overall, what are the similarities between alien greys, shadow people, jinn, and Archons? But a lot of these traits overlap between these. And I, uh, I would like to do a deeper dive sometime and grab that book. But I just wanted to mention that that archon idea, that, that prehistory of man here well before us. Yeah, I came across that book actually in my research from a woman named Mary Sutherland. Oh, yeah. Who met with uh, Rosemary and Galish. I think they might have written a book together, but they were definitely working together and aligning their information on jinn, uh, Solomonic magic, 
and the parallels. And I, so I'll have a piece from that later regarding King Solomon. So if you guys know who King Solomon was, uh, we talked about him before a little bit with his yeah. magic ring. Right, he was the son of David, you know, the giant slayer. <laughs> and so I refreshed my Sunday school knowledge looking, <laughs> looking into the stuff a lot. It's kind of interesting. But he's a figure in all of the Abrahamic religions. So it's interesting because he's held in high regard in all of those. Yeah. A common denominator. Yeah, actually out of King Solomon's story is born Kabbalah, right? I don't know. We're not going to go to that right now. Okay. That's another day. Please stop opening cans of worms. <laughs> trying to get to the end. Jeremy needs to go to the next I part. I have so much information. <laughs> okay, sorry. Continue. That's okay. Okay, so there's a lot to get into. I didn't know we jump into the gin talk right away because I really want to get into paranormal experiences that it happened during wartime. But Chris, before I do that, can you please give us a little sneak peek of what's going on in the, uh, the expansion because I'm excited for it. Yeah, the expansion should be really fun. Following along your theme of the sort of wartime monsters, I'm going to go across the oceans and not just look at the Middle East, but look at different periods of time and different locations around the globe where people encountered bizarre things like rock apes in Vietnam. Um, they weren't just battling the Viet Cong, apparently. Uh, Indonesian monkey mermen. Ooh. We also got watery crocosaurus explosions. Shut up. Which I'm not going to explain right now. A bunch of other stuff, but one of my favorites we're going to do, it's not quite paranormal, but it's just fun. It's uh, when George Bush narrowly escapes the jaws of cannibals in World oh, War yeah. II. Chris, how does someone listen to an expansion? Well, I'll tell you what, John. Pretty simple. You head on over to Bleepful.com and you hit the bright red expansion button. Yeah! And that'll give you double episodes. So if you want some more juice in your day, a little more belief hole gunk on your ears, I don't know, <laughs> on your skunk, a little more belief hole gunk on your skunk. If you need more to binge, you've gone through the catalog, or you just want to hear what's coming up because it sounds fascinating, uh, head to beliefhole.com and sign up for the expansion. It's five bucks a month and you get double episodes yeah. every month. Link in the show notes. I think it's a good deal. Nice. So let's, let's dig deep into this gin lore. So I, the whole reason I got into this gin topic is because of this story I received from Jen good friend, listener of the show. So to set this up, I was thinking about the horrors of war, the tragedy, the trauma, obvious pain and suffering caused that literally will haunt a serviceman or woman for the rest of their lives, depending on what they experienced, what they saw, the trauma they endured. And I thought, combine that, that kind of darkness, that potential for dark energy uh, and that atmosphere of unease. And I always thought this was kind of a fascinating concept too, being alien in a strange land with strange new customs and beliefs that you don't quite understand, making you feel kind of off kilter when you're there and uncertain, which adds to that fear of the unknown. But building this, this atmosphere of unease, and I thought, I can imagine how this could be a breeding ground for the supernatural. Hold your, you know, cynicism, skepticism, oh, we'll tell some stories you can believe them or not. That makes sense though, that just that vibe of uncertainty and yeah. fear and also the surrounding death and lives cut short too early. Right. And we've covered that before that the more you look into the stuff, you find that it seems to be the case that there are entities that are drawn to this dark energy that mm -hmm. feed on this. And I'm not speaking specifically of gin, but we've talked about the fear eaters, the nightmare feeders, the entities feeding on fear and tragedy. They're drawn to maybe battlegrounds or um, places where, where there have been wars for decades. Like Afghanistan is essentially a centuries old battleground, you know, with constant war. And that fear and tragedy that might be injected in that area because of this constant war over the generations, that might allow something to linger there for decades or centuries to come, maybe sleeping beneath the sand until a new conflict brings new food. Yeah, exactly. It's a creepy concept, but it, it kind of makes sense with a lot of things. You think about, it just reminds me of, do you remember the Battle of Chukamangua we talked about? Yeah. In the Snallygaster episode. Mm -hmm. Old Green Eyes. Old Green Eyes. This creature that would come and feed off the corpses of the dead in the Civil War. Yeah, that was a yeah. fascinating story. Yeah, and it predated that battle, but it seemed to be drawn to that, and there were eyewitness testimony. We covered that in the Snallygaster episode in the expansion, but something about war. Yeah, just the intense negative energy of war. Mm -hmm. If there is a fear eater, that's where they're going to feed. Yeah. And beyond that, so the other aspect, which actually Jen's brother's story potentially ties into is the idea of the time loop, the tape echo, a place being supercharged with energy, um, energetic forces because of the intense 
tragedy, trauma, loss impacted over time, potentially yeah. like Gettysburg. Afghanistan is kind of like a countrywide Gettysburg mm -hmm. in the sense that there has been so much war over the years and generations, oh so God. much death. And yeah, you think about even going back to the Russian encampments there and yeah. you know, Cold War era and intertribal fighting and warfare. I mean, for so long, but that supercharging of that could create potentially a time loop, right? I mean, that's a cool idea. You'd have to tell me a good, compelling story well, for me to believe one. it. We've got one. We've got one, and you can decide what this might be, what the experience is, and that's that's coming up here in a second. This isn't the same concept as getting stored, like yes. a tape? Mm -hmm. Oh, like stone tape theory? Stone tape theory, yeah. yeah. But in stone tape theory, it's just the dead or whatever whatever apparition you're seeing repeating it. Are you talking about that? Oh, so you're not talking about somewhat like a soldier getting stuck in a loop of time. So that's a different thing. So it's possible. You, you do hear a lot the story of the, the guy on patrol that never goes back to camp, right? The soldier who's always on duty. Oh, after death. After death, watching yeah. over the soldiers. There's stories like that in Afghanistan, in other places in the Middle East and all over. They never get to clock out. When you think about like the extreme stress of war and how, you know, we, there's that great example of that soldier. I think it was a Spanish conflict a long time ago, but ended up traveling to a far, far away land by accident somehow. Oh yeah. And it's the time slip theory, but to me it also makes sense as, you know, you hear these crazy moments of stress where people uh, are put in these positions, are able to do things that should be physically impossible. Right. You know, lifting cars, moving things with their mind. There's tons of Fordian accounts of that sort of stuff in high stress moments. So I feel like war would be a place for crazy, strange, unexplained things to occur on a regular basis. Opens up portals. Portals in all sorts of different arenas. Like mind portals? Mind portals, yeah. for sure. Physical portals? Well, that's absolutely <laughs> the case. And they're also going back into gin. And in this area, considering what you mentioned earlier, John, the idea of can gin be everywhere? Or are they relegated to the places where people believe in and them? If they are everywhere, how much chaos are they evoking on places where people don't even know they exist? Oh, sure. Exactly. Well, some people would argue, depending on your belief, that the kind of demon idea in Christianity, what you see as a ghost or a poltergeist, tricksters, if you're kind of in just the Christian mindset. Everything's a demon. Everything's a demon. If you're in the mindset of strict accordance with the Muslim faith, you would see it as a jinn. Or if your mind's a little more open, you might see it as something that just lives in an existential right, realm right. of reality, but is affecting and feeding on us. Well, that's what the jinn are in Islam, which is kind of interesting because the jinn kind of occupy this additional space that in Christianity, like for instance, they're similar to the angels, the fallen angels. I think his name is... Iblis, I think, was the Satan figure in Islamic faith. He leads a rebellion against Allah, God, and is cast down, but he was a jinn, not an angel. But the difference that's kind of interesting is angels don't have free will. They're basically servants of God. But Lucifer was able to... Well, in Christianity, Lucifer rebelled. He had a moment of... And actually, my friend Pat had like a whole class that talked about this one issue about if angels were real, it was philosophy of logic, but how can an angel become sentient and make that choice? How, how can he gain that free will and ask that question? Yeah. The interesting thing in Islam is that he wasn't an angel. The jinn are given free will. They are born with their amoral. They can choose their path unlike angels. So angels don't have free will? And like, where is that to say that in the Bible or something? I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure that... Uh, I mean, that can't be true though, obviously, because then the... Lucifer wouldn't, be. wouldn't have been able to rebel. Well, then yeah. that's the question. And they're all coming from the similar um, shared root faith. There's a lot of paradoxes when you get into philosophy of logic in relation to religion. The famous thought puzzle of, can God create something so big that he can't lift it? Right. Sort of this looping logical thing you have to do. It's like, well, he's God, so he should be able to you know, create anything, you know, but can he build something that limits himself? That's what the human experience is. God experiencing the world through yeah. people. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a definitely interesting idea. So we've been swimming around in and out of gin, in and out of some of the folklore and culture in the Middle East specifically, because that's where some of the stories are coming from today. But let's tell the first story. And this will kind of set up the scene. And like I said, it touches on all those potential realities when you're in this theater of war with the darkness, the tragedy, the history of death there, the looping time, stone tape theory. Could they potentially be entities that might feed on that energy? Let's find out. We're going to figure it out right now because we know the absolute truth. Um, <laughs> Okay, John, you want to play it up? Jenna's going to give us a story that her brother experienced in Afghanistan in an outpost called the Combat Outpost Xerox. Reminds you of Ziggurat. Well, yeah, it's that same region, you know. Oh, how is it, how is it spelled? Z-E-R-O-K. Xerox, okay. And fun fact, apparently, I was trying to corroborate the story and see if there are any other hauntings in the area. 
you can't find American military bases on Google in foreign countries. That's probably good. Which makes a I lot of sense. Why. After I searched the second one, I was like, it's probably a pretty popular place. You know, like, <laughs> and I was like, oh, that makes total sense that they wouldn't have it. So, and so also for that reason, we're keeping his name anonymous. Mm-hmm. So Combat Outpost Yurok, which is a small outpost located in the shadow of the Hindu Kush Mountains in Pakatika, I probably pronounced that wrong, province of Afghanistan. This happened around 2013. He was deployed in 2012, but this likely happened in 2013. And it may or may not have been outside of this specific outpost. Potentially it was in another small outpost in the area. And so at this outpost, there are these towers that kind of overlook, I believe, the outpost. They're right nearby. Our troops at the time were there working with Afghani soldiers. Right. So that's kind of the setup of where he's at. He's with a friend, a fellow soldier at this outpost up late at night. Let's let it roll. This is a story that my brother told me a couple of years ago, but happened in 2012, 2013, when he was deployed to Afghanistan. He was up late one night with a couple of other guys, and they start hearing and seeing gunfire from the tower. They started hearing also the radio go off with Afghan soldiers yelling about demons which they didn't really think a whole lot of it because I guess the Afghan soldiers would sometimes get really drunk and start firing rounds off into the desert as you do (laughs) but they go to check on them anyway and there's nothing there there should have been at least three guys hundreds of shell casings food, gear, and there was just nothing in the tower They just kind of looked at each other and shrugged it off, didn't really talk about it again, and moved on. I, of course, believe my brother because nothing like this ever really happened to us as kids, and he was never really open to the paranormal or supernatural until this, of course. So for him to admit it is, it's pretty big. pretty crazy. Yeah. It always helps when you have someone who is not into this Mm -hmm. sort of research or these sort of stories to have their own experience and then, you know, share it. Yeah. To be a complete skeptic and then be like, you know, I did see something weird. I mean, it really brings it home when you, you're seeing gunfire in the desert, right? You're hearing over the radio, which is interesting. You're hearing voices coming in, yelling in clear Afghani accents about demons and you're hearing gunshots. And then naturally you go up to check and Absolutely nothing there. Yeah. There should have been, she said, according to him, when soldiers are camping out on guard, there would be all kinds of gear and food in the room with whoever was shooting frantically in the night. My brother estimated that there should have been hundreds of shell casings in that room where the shots were coming from by how much shooting he was hearing. And there was, in his words, she sent me a screenshot of his text message, nothing, period, in, period, the, period, tower. Pretty pretty final. And then, of course, he texted, you're not using my name right. Um... <laughs> So another really interesting thing was they heard the Afghani voices over the radio, right? Yelling demons, whatever. Demons in the desert. What was the word they were saying? Wasn't there a specific? Well, Jen thought that when she was remembering the story before she verified with her brother, she thought that maybe they were yelling about an ifrit. Ifrit, yeah. Ifrit, yeah, I think that's how you say it, which is essentially like a fire. It's it's a kind of jinn, I believe. It's like a certain category. Yeah, because there are certain ones that are more well-known than others. And you get enough to contend with when you're overseas in war. You got to fight fire demons. Right. Well, this, and this is the interesting thing too, is that the radio, the radio voice over radio, like I was saying, there was no radio in the tower at all. Oh, okay. There's oh, no yeah. way they could have communicated with the Americans from that tower at that time. So how are they picking it up? And this is a theme you'll hear with some of these stories coming from Afghanistan with spirit encounters, maybe this time echo, whatever it is, where they'll hear voices over the radio. It's kind of a regular theme, which makes sense if it's just kind of like, a haunting type thing. Yeah. A lot of times that will be used, the the kind of white noise. We know EVPs and that kind of thing, but it's interesting, like rebroadcasts. Yeah. If you will, of that kind of transmission. Spooky radio. And then, of course, she suggested to him the time slip idea, uh, which apparently freaked him out because he'd never heard anything like that before. But I think that kind of turned his head a little bit about it. And of course it would if that happened to you. Uh, so I hope you're doing good, Jen's brother, uh, whose name we will not speak uh, for your anonymity. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, thanks for sharing it regardless. Yeah, and thank you, Jen, so much for bringing that to us. It's fascinating. And uh, she sent me further information on the Ifrit, if that's how you say it, specifically, as well as Jin. But this is when it opened up for me because I was just going to do the military experiences with the paranormal. And then when she told me this story, it was a perfect segue to get into the, the Jin in folklore, in spirituality, but in actual real encounters and experiences, allegedly, uh, which we're going to get to shortly. Cool. Let's take a quick break. Let's do it. Be back. Now, enjoy this expansion preview from Season 3, Episode 11, Monsters of War. Now enveloped in the darkness of the night, the team put on their night vision goggles. Yet they saw nothing. Still, things were about to get freaky. Hallucinations happen, but what happened was beyond comprehension. First, we heard a sound like a huge airplane taking off. A loud, low buzz that slowly increased in pitch. We had to yell over comms to hear each other. Uh, 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 I can't hear you, Mikey! I can't hear you! Everywhere I looked, I kept seeing what looked like glowing eyes staring back at me. But once I would center my focus to where I saw them, they would disappear. We were panicked. Everyone was holding their rifles at the high ready. We were expecting some kind of ambush attack. Then it all just stopped. Everything got dark. The only thing I could hear was my breath and the blood pumping in my head. We stopped, dug into the side of the mountain, and performed SLLS. Stop, look, listen, and smell for about 10 minutes. Nothing. Not even bugs. The air and the land were silent. The team was exhausted, and were now sure that something waited for them in the darkness. Intention seemingly ominous, but unknown. While hurriedly moving through the scrub, they were suddenly met by the sight of a man dressed in light-colored robes. The man was slowly making his way towards them. Witnesses report that it moved in an unnatural way. He seemed to pass through any and all obstacles in his way as though they were made of air. He seemed to melt over and around the rocks, through the NOD's night vision goggles. His eyes glowed. I scoped up on him and saw that he was looking directly at me. It was pitch black. There was no way he could have seen us from the distance without any kind of night optics. Suddenly, he stopped. He picked up one of his limbs and held it in the air almost like he was waving at me. Then the arm melted back into his form, like it wasn't an arm at all, but some kind of extendable proboscis that was meant to look like an arm from a distance. I was about to ask the guys if they could see him when he suddenly disappeared. If you enjoyed that clip, head over to bleafhole.com and hit the expansion button to get access to all of our extra episodes. back, Jax and Jills. Welcome back. Yes, I wanted to clear up, John, what you had asked before. So I had all these notes because this is a lot to dive into, but the difference between jinn and demons. Yes, do tell. Did we ever answer the question if uh, they are besides anywhere in the okay, Middle so East? Because I feel like there was never an answer to that question. There's definitely like, you know, I can't ask a jinn and know for sure, but it's, I don't think in the literature they talk about anywhere other than the Middle East because it's written from the Middle well, East. So um, John might be talking more about just the current belief system about jinn or the folklore. And it seems to be, I mean, I think it, it is kind of a matter of perspective because of course it is kind of understood. And I think in the, uh, the faith belief system that they are everywhere. 
Uh, yeah, I, would, they also I mean, say, that makes sense. Makes sense. Unless we have different kinds, like instead of gin, we have fairies in other parts of the or, world. Or maybe they're all the same thing. They're all the, but they could, be, they could be different races of these kind of entities, these uh, whatever lives in this parallel universe. They seem uh, to have similar attitudes uh, sometimes. Yeah, that f- as far as like being amoral and trickster. Yeah. Snatch you up. It seems to be, and like, again, I'm no expert, but it's a matter of perspective, I think, whether that's the school of thought you go with. That I don't even know if there's an official. Oh, there's got to be. But yeah, oh yeah, like we were saying, the, one of the details, and I have some interesting information here. Um, I, got, I had a lot of fun getting my questions answered on Quora for some of these questions. Because oh. there are people who, you know, are over there or in regions where Islam is the thing and they're more familiar with the, the lore. Right. And the belief system and also the details and on an average day-to-day basis, which is kind of interesting. Very, uh, well, I forget what percentage of the culture believes that jinn are real, but it's a high, high I number. I think in Pakistan, 80% of practicing Muslims believe jinn exists. 80%. Yeah, I even read a story about a politician. It was alleged that he was able to manipulate a jinn to give his opponent a heart attack. This is like in the papers. Oh yeah. Which reminds me of Iceland and the, sort of the, the strong belief there in elves and, you know, having to talk about where their cities are on our plane oh, right. of existence in the other realm. So you can build around and uh-huh. build the roads around. Kind of fascinating, but the same idea. Hidden yeah. folk. Oh, and there's the other side of that question too, of if they exist in other places other than the Middle East or where people believe in them, is there is also that idea that, and someone even warned about this in a snippet I grabbed, I'm not sure if we'll get to it, but basically saying like, it seems to be the case that the more you study jinn, uh, especially if you aren't originally a believer, the more you follow it and look into it, the more they look at you. Oh, I heard and that. And they see you and they say, oh, hello. You recognize us now. You give us energy. Yeah, we'll scare They're coming for you, John. You. Uh-uh. They're coming for you now. No. They're not interested in me because I don't care about them. Because you eat liver meat. Well, let's leave the organ meats out of this, okay? <laughs> All right. So, Jerry, what is the difference between a gin and a demon? Okay. So, this... This comes from Wikipedia, unfortunately, but it seems to be the case from what I've read in other places too. Among the jinn, there are different types of believers, for example. So this is one distinction. Jinns can be Muslim. Jinns can be Christian. Jinns can be atheist, right? Be Jewish, be atheist, Satanist, whatever. They they have free will to believe. It's just fascinating to me that they can choose not to believe that God exists at all because they're predominantly, in my mind, a religious idea. Right? They exist because they were told to us in a religious texts, the Quran. That's where we get the idea of their existence in our understanding now. Of course, they're pre-Islamic. You know, they go back to the Apkalu. Do you guys remember the Apkalu? Remember those? Oh, yeah. Those dudes that hold the buckets and they have the wings on the Sumerian reliefs? Yeah. Yeah, these guys, John. Remember these guys? Uh, oh, yes. Talked about it in our humanoid episode, I think. Yeah, the Apkalu is a, a term that's found in cuneiform in those inscriptions. But they are referred to, like some of those reliefs are called like the genie. So this idea goes way back, but it seems to have been a part of the early Islamic reality as Islam came into being, which of course came, I think, what was it, 500 AD or 800 AD, something to that effect. It's one of the newer religions as far as the Abrahamic religions. But So the jinn had been there, but then became more formalized, incorporated in the religious version. Yeah. So they were a living race on the earth. And this always reminds me of uh, the gate. Oh yeah, the old gods? The old gods. So in the gate, if you really think about it, which is a great movie, guys, Stephen Dorff at his best uh, as, like a, as a little eight. boy. Um, in that in that movie, essentially they find this geode in a tree, and the tr- when the tree falls over, these things come up from under the earth, right? Which is the predominant place of the demons or whatever. But these things that come up that we call the potty walkers, if you catch one, they grant wishes. Mm. Oh, much like well, a genie, the bastardized version of the jinn, right? Well, in, that comes from when it comes to the actual jinn. Uh, and genie is a singular, jinn is plural, uh, generally. Oh, so genie is actually, it's not just a corruption of the term well, jinn? the spelling in English, it's an anglicized version mm-hmm. uh, based off of a French, which was kind of a different definition, G-E-N-I-E, because it was, had to be pulled from a non, non-Latin non character, right. so it's J-I-N-N-I, but it's kind of just squiggles that look cool from our perspective. But in the movie The Gate, they could grant wishes, and it reminded me of when they, they played the record backwards and they were talking about the old gods and these things are, if you want to consider them demigods uh, or a kind of deity, they're not really. They, I think they can be called upon, kind of worshipped or called to do your bidding. But what's interesting about them that sets them apart is that they are mortal. What? They have lifespans. I didn't know that. They live a lot longer, I think, than humans and they're stronger, faster, invisible when they want to be. Uh, but they, Tolkien's elves. But unlike demons, which die when... 
in the Islamic faith when their father demon, leader demon, the one, if you can think about it like vampires, if you returned, you kill the sire, you kill the sire, the devil dies. They're called, in Islam, they're called devils or demons. And so that kind of distinguishes them from the jinn as well. Okay, so the Islamic faith, they have demons and jinn. They're yes. separate entities. They're called uh, devils, it seems like, okay. some of the time, the translation. So the idea about the granting wishes, right, which of course our Disney version was taken from you know, the lamp in Aladdin, mm -hmm. right? The original, what was that, A Thousand and One Nights, I think. Oh, it was yeah. Old Arabian Tales, yeah. Right. There was a French guy, right, who, who translated all those. Oh, well, then that's where he translated genie. In Latin, it comes from genius, which is interesting because they were, especially the Apkalu in the, like the, I think Assyrian, Sumerian, before Islam, they were considered that form of genius, which meant in Latin, I think it was a uh, tutel, tutelary. What is that word? <laughs> it's a fun word. I should have grabbed this word, but it basically means like they, they were tutoring figures. They were sages and guides. Uh, I don't know that word, but. Tutelage? Um, yeah. Tutory figures. That sounds really silly in my head. Because they taught, you're saying that's kind of like wishes? Because you're giving them knowledge? No, what no. You so the, the wish connection, I think, comes more to um, not so much that older version of the sage, but we go back to the story of Solomon. Yes, right? Because this is Solomon. a confusion between demons yeah. and... So let's break this down quick, because this is a really interesting story, and then we'll get into some modern accounts, cool. people that have witnessed this. So in the old religions, in the three Abrahamic religions, we had King Solomon. He was the son of David, right? The guy who slayed the giants mm -hmm. with the sling. <laughs> Giant killer. And long story short, everybody comes from his line. All right. Like Jesus is of David's line. So he's of Solomon's line. Solomon's David's son. Solomon was, he did some crazy stuff though. Definitely turned away from his God. He cheated with Bathsheba. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Actually, no, I'm sorry. David cheated with Bathsheba and had Solomon. Solomon was the son of David oh. and Bathsheba. Oh, he's a bastard. He was a bastard. And he went on to make Jesus. So that was kind of interesting. You know, you find stuff out when you're researching. Anyways, the point is he built Solomon's temple. And if you know anything about Freemasonic importance, the value of Solomon's temple. Uh, and the magic around it. It's almost like a worshipped idea, Solomon's temple. It's a magical place built to perfection and it's venerated in Freemasonry for that. And some would say the Illuminati and the, the symbology involved in there. But the story is, is King Solomon was given the power over demons or jinn in the Islamic sense to build his temple. That's how he built it was by enslaving these demons to do his bidding. I think he had, a, I think was it his ring? Mm -hmm. Signet ring. Signet ring that controlled the demons or the jinn in this case. And that might be where that comes from, the granting wishes. So this comes from uh, Mary Sutherland, who is friends with Rosemary Ellen Guiley, who has that book on jinn you were talking about yeah. that we'll have in the show notes. She says the jinn are not confined to the Middle East or to the past. They exist in their own realm, probably a parallel dimension, and have the ability and the desire to enter our world and interact with us. The jinn have been among us in antiquity, and they are among us now. According to another story, Solomon summoned the jinn to his crystal-paved palace, where they sat at tables made of iron. Now, this is interesting because oh, yeah. in folklore, iron is supposed to weaken supernatural entities. So this could help in controlling them. But it's just an amazing image to think this crystal palace, this giant dining hall or something, and these demons are just sitting there stuck in these iron chairs, just like, what do you need, Solomon? Do my bidding. The Quran tells us how the king made them work at building palaces, making carpets, and creating ponds, statues, and gardens. Whenever Solomon wanted to travel to faraway places, the jinn carried him on their backs. Fly, demon! I'm a jinn! Hush your mouth! Ah, man, he really took advantage of these guys. And this reminds me of, in our <laughs> intro, magicians are demons. Oh, right. They would be using the same thing, practicing the same thing that Aleister Crowley wanted to do, which right. is to summon demons to bend them to your will. Bend them to your will. Put them to task. It's funny, too, because Solomon's story mirrors a lot of Crowley's story. They both have this desire to control demons. Right. A really interesting book about one that. One gave birth to the line of Jesus and one was Aleister Crowley. <laughs> so there's definitely a difference there, but it is interesting as far as the working with demons or yeah. jinn in the Islamic sense. All right. For those of you who don't like history and, and connections, sorry for all that. I know it took some time though. to get to the stories, but I thought it was interesting to kind of carve that out. You got to lay the groundwork of the lore before you can really appreciate the stories and the experiences in contemporary times. You got to command the jinn to build the tapestry about your story. Okay, so we do have some stories here. We have one story actually that is really fascinating, but if we don't have time for it, we might get to that in expansion, right, Chris? It's another story about troops in Afghanistan. Yeah. And it's really creepy. It's pretty eerie. 
But since you're focusing on all the war stories in the expansion, which are going to be really interesting, I want to get some real accounts of people, just everyday folk, claiming to have these experiences with the djinn in modern times. This I call tree djinn, and apparently djinn are fans of trees. They make <laughs> homes in trees, I believe. Um, Again, like fairies. There's all kinds of warnings. So weird, that overlap. So this comes from Mubashar, who is a Pakistani studied at the University of Sargoda. And this was his response to a question about, have you had an experience with the djinn? And I call it tree djinn. Yes, I have seen djinn with my eyes. It was 2003 and I was 11. I went out to play with my friends. It was a hot summer day. My friends were playing cricket. I was sitting under a tree watching them and talking with my friend who was sitting next to me. Suddenly, I felt that someone was present near us. I looked here and there but found nothing. My heartbeat increased by two times. And what happened next is the most horrible scene of my life. I looked upward to the tree and saw this scene. A woman was sitting there in the tree. She was wearing a black, dirty dress. She was facing opposite side to me. Thank God. Her hair was bad, curly and so long that it was touching the ground. Her feet were turned. I managed to run away along with my friend. Let's get out of here! Run! After that scene, I developed a condition of anxiety and fear. I didn't take food for three days. I had hylophobia. Even I hated cricket after that. Interesting. Okay, so he includes a picture that we'll have in the show notes. It's a woman sitting in a tree, kind of raised above him, looking in the opposite direction. Oh, I see that, yeah. And imagine that with like... That's a, just a representation. Right. You know, she looks fairly pleasant. <laughs> she, she looks okay there. Just a little, maybe Quite friendly. I mean, it didn't... So her feet were turned. That was... Or she had long, bad black curly hair it went all the, the way down to the ground but if, if it was positioned where this one is I mean that hair would be going down like 10 feet so what was the worst part about it the I think it, and, well in the initial sense of dread that he had oh even before he saw her like he knew there was something wrong right his heart started racing before he saw anyone and oh. then he looked up and there's this all in black figure with long curly unkempt hair reaching down to the ground facing away from you yeah in this kind of weird yeah. and feet turned. I don't know. It definitely sounds, I mean, yeah, it could be explained. I just think when you combine that kind of fear, so this is the fear he mentioned. It's called hylophobia, which I think we can all relate to. And I think everyone probably has to some degree. Also known as xylophobia, fear of xylophones. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. It's the irrational fear of wooded areas. Some people find that their fear is worse at night, while others are equally afraid at all times of the day. Xylophobia is sometimes connected to other phobias, such as animal fears, but may occur alone. Mm, yeah. Which makes sense. I mean, a fear of the forest. I mean, that's a pretty common... Yeah. A chronic fear, though, like that severe. Well, it would affect you after something like this that you saw in the forest. Yeah. Well, did that you just... saw like a shimmer man. A shimmer man. A glimmer, glimmer guy? Man. Glimmer, glimmer man. Glimmer man, yeah. Glimmer guy. <laughs> Freaky stuff. Yeah, it, and now he doesn't like cricket anymore. That's a bummer. Why cricket? Because you played near the woods? That's what they were playing when yeah, you saw Yeah, that's it. what happened. It's like if he was drinking coffee, he probably wouldn't like coffee okay, anymore. Yeah, that makes sense. That's terrifying, huh? Did it say how old he was? He was 11, I think. 11, yeah. Definitely old enough to know what a woman in a tree looks like. That something's not right. Yeah, yeah. something's not right. Reminds me of a creepy dream, you know? Yeah, I was just going to say it makes sense. If he had that three days of fear afterward, terrible anxiety, maybe the whole point was to create that if this thing was out there hunting. It's a fear eater? Yeah. That was a good dinner. Yummy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, if you guys are down for a couple more... I hate your fear. <laughs> oh, you did the Snally Gaster voice, didn't you? Or was it the Chickamauga? Chickamauga. Oh, that's the voice you did. <laughs> Can we drop that at the end of the episode or yeah, somewhere? Yeah, we'll drop the, to? the old green eyes story. I'll eat your fear. There. Chickamauga. Two tones going. You're getting freaked <laughs> out a little bit. All right, what's the next one? Let's do another story. If you want to get real crazy, real interesting with this stuff, I have a story coming up called To Kill a Jin. And apparently they're mortal and they have been killed by mortal men before, even in combat, I believe. Maybe if they come into this dimension reality. But I have a story of a man who, that's his job. Not like assassin. Oh, he's a gin killer. Commanding other gins. It's a really interesting story. That's coming up. But let's do a couple more that are more personal experiences direct from the internet. So they're true. These next couple come from Slaylax, which is an awesome username, on Reddit. 
So this is really interesting. His story, it becomes generational. Something happens to his dad when he's a kid, and then it seems to have carried on to his sister. So let's do the first story here. It's called Night Stalker. Clean up an aisle terror. Uh, clean up an aisle terror. Wow. Yeah, I know. Sorry, cheesy. Oh, I get it like, like stocking shelves. Yeah. Okay. I thought that'd be a great job just because you could put that. Yeah, I'm a Night Stalker. That's true. Like Boat Captain. <laughs> okay. This be a good title. I posted a while back about a gin on here before. I said I would post about my dad's encounters when he was little and overseas. Back home, my dad grew up in a religious household, but for some reason he used to curse God all the time. My grandmother used to yell at him all the time, but my dad didn't care. He used to say as many bad things about God that he could. My grandmother used to warn him that God was going to punish him for his bad words. So one day my dad went to the store at night with his older brother. His older brother left my dad by himself for one second when he went to just grab something. Wait here, I'll be right back. As soon as his brother left, a black figure with red eyes approached my dad. It then started yelling at my dad to stop cursing God. Stop cursing God, little boy. And that he was going to go to hell for doing that. Then the black figure disappeared as soon as his brother came back. My dad told his brother what happened, and he told my grandmother about it. She started to tell him, See, I warned you. Anyways, ever since then, my dad has never said anything bad about God. The thing about jinns is that there are religious ones who actually pray to God as religious people would, but there are also malicious ones who scare people. Please be wary about looking up jinns, as the more questions you ask about them, the more they are attracted to you. Oh, great. Oh, great. I hope you guys enjoy the episode. Yeah. <laughs> Take them over the team. Um, so why did they think it was a jinn? Oh, just because of its countenance? The dark shadowy I mean, thing with dark, red eyes? dark shadowy tall figure with red glowing eyes. Is that their traits? We never really went over the traits. Yeah, I have a very basic list here that I think we skipped over because we got so into the mythology here. But some basic attributes of jinn, they're shapeshifters, as we know. And some of the stories that we've heard that I think you're going to touch on in the expansion too, about how they can shapeshift. They're almost like moving shadows seen by military personnel in Afghanistan and Iraq. Take different forms. Yeah, you can see them sometimes almost sliding as shadows across the rocks. Really creepy, interesting descriptions. But they shapeshift the animals, human form. But they say in folklore, maybe the faith too, that the eyes don't change. The eyes they can't quite get right. Again, that's with so many tricksters, supernatural, shapeshifters, supernatural yeah. things in general. It's like that's where your truth lives in your eyes. Made from smokeless fire, right? We've heard that yeah. before. Men are made in Islam and I think in the Bible generally that men are made from clay. Angels are made from light and jinn are made from fire. Jinn are made from smokeless fire. The first ones, then they procreate and apparently mate like rabbits. They can interbreed with humans, right? According to the... Most believe no. Uh, oh, really? Because okay. they live outside this dimension, but we actually have a story about that. I read something somewhere about that. There is some schools of thought, yeah, you can actually marry a jinn. Right. Some schools of thought. And that gets into like the, the ghost intercourse. Uh, oh, spectrophilia. spectrophilia. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not quite the same thing, but... Oh, yeah. Mm. I mean, they're really ghosts. They're other men. It just right. reminds me of like, it would have made a great like 90s TV, sci-fi TV series where like someone's just trying to hold down a job but secretly is a oh. gin. Who was the guy who was detective but he's also a vampire? Oh, great show. Forever Night. Forever Night. Yeah. Okay, so continuing on the attributes here. Like we mentioned, they can choose good or evil. They have free will to do that. Oh, another thing. They are known to cause nightmares. Well, that makes sense. Since the jinn that followed Iblis, those that followed like the Satan figure, they became regarded as devils. Okay. It seems like, at least in some schools of thought. They were born out of the same... Yeah, and his vow was, I'm going to turn as many people away from God as possible. I'm going to basically knock them off the path of good and righteousness, tempt them, torture them, all that kind of stuff. So you see those parallels. And that's why if they go down that road, they become the evil form of trickster, as opposed to just like the fairy, a little more amoral. It seems like there's that choice there. Yeah. They can be bound to talismans and controlled, supposedly. That's the idea. That's got to be where the lamp idea comes in, mm -hmm. right? Bound to objects. Right. Dual dimensional, like we mentioned coming in and out, and they outnumber humans, like I said, made like rabbits over there in the other dimension. So, but that's the basic idea, basic idea of, of what these are. Fascinating. Thank you. It's not about you. Yeah, it's not really about you at all. So out of this four creations, jinn and humans are unique in a sense that they have free will and the ability to reason. 
Angels too have the ability to reason, but they do not have free will, like we mentioned. I still don't get that part though. What do you I mean? I mean, how is that possible if Lucifer... We're talking about Islam. Jinn don't exist in Christianity. And Lucifer... So John's just saying, how is it possible that angels don't have free will? But then Lucifer decided to... Lucifer was Christian faith. Well, in the Christian faith, I don't know. That's the question. That's like a logical question that people actually... Like, how did that happen? How did, yeah. God, did God... Sort of like God allowed Judas to betray Jesus right, so one of that those you could have... sorts of things, yeah. An event that created both sides. Right. You could have the fall. You also have varying stories like Judas dies in two different ways in the Bible. So there's a paradox there. If you believe it's the literal word of God, which one's right? How can you have two of the same accounts, that kind of stuff? So that's not quite as big of a right, it's conundrum. It's less of a metaphysical whole, problem. The whole evil versus good conundrum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, then that's why I think this has become, like we talked about, if you guys missed it in our expansion about um, Dante, who translated the Alien Races book. Oh, who found the secret Russian book about yeah, alien races. and believed yeah. he was an alien hybrid, a or at least he was the leader of that militia. That was a great story. I think you're free to himself, not maybe not himself, but Azazel was like a good guy. And I think that's another name for Iblis, which is like the Luciferian or the Satan figure in Islam. So you have that idea that some people believe in theosophy, maybe the Illuminati idea, the Luciferian idea where he was a good guy, he gave, Prometheus, he gave us fire, he gave us knowledge. He rebelled against God, but in order to give humanity power, mm -hmm. like there is a line of thought that thinks that, and that's the illumined kind of idea, even though the Illuminati or the Freemasons would say on the level, they're Christian, Judaic faith, but you see these hints at illumination, light, light bringer. And that's what people tie it to like Luciferianism, but there's that divide between that interpretation, is he a good figure? Is he a bad figure? Or is he a necessary figure? Right. Like the Judas. Playing idea. a role like Judas, yeah. It's an interesting question. Yeah. Jinns are believed to resemble humans in that they eat and drink, have children and die, are subject to judgment, so will either be sent to heaven or hell according to their deeds, but they were much faster and stronger than humans. Iblis, or Satan, is the first known jinn mentioned by name in the Quran. He was included among the angels prior to his downfall due to his righteousness. He basically was hanging out with the angels because he was such a cool gin. Basically, they're superheroes, right? They can turn invisible. They can move really quickly. You know, they just have longer lifespans. I think they're also part human, part animal in early representations, like the Epcot we talked about. I just want one question before we do one more story. Yeah. Where do the wishes come from in the genie? I mean, my guess would be Solomon. And the, oh, that's right. So binding something to do your bidding. To an object, for instance, right. like the lamp. But in... Solomon's case, the signet ring. Mm -hmm. And in the original story, the genie, I think his third wish wasn't, or they didn't wish for genie's freedom because- Oh, in the original story? Just the Disney one. Because that's what everyone wants to yeah. be free, you know? Because he was, Robin was so lovable. Gin in the mirror? So this comes from the same guy. I've read a lot of his stuff. He definitely is deep into, like it's his faith. So a good person to reference then, huh? Right. This is called Gin in the Mirror. This is my sister's story that gives me goosebumps every time I think about it. My sister brought the story up to me a couple of times, and every single time she does, I get creeped out. This happened to my sister a couple years ago in our apartment. She was in my parents' room praying. We are Muslim, so my sister was wearing a headscarf and long skirt to pray in my parents' room, which has a huge mirrored closet. So my sister was praying in front of it which is a big nope for me. Hard pass. <laughs> so as she is praying, she hears someone open the room door behind her. Everyone that was home was in the living room. So as she bends over while praying, she hears footsteps behind her coming closer. Because she is bending down, she can't see from the skirt. The skirt's blocking her view. So as she rises up standing, she looks in the mirror and makes a dash to the living room, not even finishing her prayer. She said that in the mirror, she saw a tall black figure behind her attempt to wrap its long arms around her when she stood up. She said as she ran, she looked back and still saw it in the mirror. She ran to my dad and told him, and he said it was nothing. Still dumbfounded, she asked him later, and he said, yeah, that was a, that was a djinn. For anyone who doesn't know what a djinn is, it's what people like to call shadow people. I can go more into details about jinns, but it's not good to keep talking about them like we have been doing all episode. <laughs> they can haunt people the more you talk about them. Maybe about a year ago, my sister said how she was laying in bed on her phone when everyone was asleep and she had her foot hanging out of the bed. A big nope for me. Hard pass. <laughs> anyway, she said something just wrapped its hand around her foot 
and she froze. She didn't know what to do and just stood still, terrified of what was holding her foot. She said it started then to stroke her foot and finally let go. I guess her gin or ghost had a foot fetish. <laughs> LOL. <laughs> Ooh. Um, yes, yeah, super creepy. What is the good of prayer if it doesn't help you against a gin attack? Good question. Maybe it wouldn't have totally got her. Maybe she had just enough prayer, prayer, prayer power, power to like get her out of that situation. Yeah. So what happens if you get caught by a gin? I don't know. That's a good question. And yeah, why well, there's you, possession why is a big thing. Why did you spell gin wrong the whole time? Okay, so J I N N is the plural for J I N N I, which is the singular of genie. So gin genie. Because I always spelled it D J I N N. Mm-hmm. I thought that's how it was spelled. That's the romanticized version. Well, how come this guy spelled it gin and he was he knows about it? I don't know. Maybe he's a liar. I mean, you can use either spelling. Either is correct. Okay. And the reason is because they're not using Latin characters. Tuss would look like squiggles. Mm-hmm. So it's extrapolated from that. It's beautiful writing. We saw it at the Houston Museum. I didn't mean to open up a war can of That's worms okay. there. And apparently you can say gins or gin as plural. From what I read, it was a lot to try to figure out. But we got the important stuff. It's interesting because they seem to have this dual modus operandi where they're, they're like human. They're a race, a living race, but there's also the supernatural aspect. Maybe just because... They have these extra abilities, mm-hmm. like possession, moving between realms. But in reality, they're mortal. They have families. They have free will. It's really strange. Interesting. We could almost be considered maybe a, a livestock to them potentially or a... Uh, That's what I think. Yeah. Well, yeah. Like I definitely think humans on some level are being used sort of like cattle. I don't mm-hmm. know exactly why or what. Power yeah, sources. And whether it's... Gen- and it's on multiple levels. Business and... Right, right. Or consumers. Yeah, it's funny. And- you think about so many potentially predatory things that we discuss on the show extraterrestrial, maybe there's treaties with governments, shadow people, whether that's jinn or somehow to do with fey folk or whatever, but there always seems to be the feeding on people somehow being used. Mm-hmm. I don't know the jinn is so much directly feeding on people, at least not in the fear. I thought that was the whole thing. Well, they... <laughs> they So the, the, the jinn, especially um, the divide of... <laughs> His mind was like... <laughs> I yeah. did say that at the it's beginning. A, I didn't say the gin specifically. I said we we're talking about things that could be drawn towards oh, like okay. battle. Right, right. Their purpose is to scare, torture the ones that choose the dark path, the ones that follow Iblis, it seems to be. They are drawn towards that negative dark energy to scare, to attack, possess. Possession is a huge thing. It's a real problem, apparently, gin possession. Whether so you when believe the, it's actually gin When or the not. gin die, if they follow Iblis, then do they become the Islamic demon? Yeah. I don't even know if they have to die to become technically considered a devil. But they have to die. Well, when they die, they are judged. So they will die and be judged, unlike angels, for instance. Right. Okay, there's a lot I have, guys, and I'll put some other stuff in the show notes. Really interesting. It goes into, like, jinn pregnancy. There's a lawsuit regarding a Saudi Arabian family who sued a jinn. Yeah. I mean, it's a real reality in that world. I'll just say a quick note about the pregnancy thing. Avoid trees. If you don't want a jinn to fall in love with you, don't wear perfume. Uh, Don't forget to say your prayer before you undress. Kind of like the fallen angel idea, are attracted to human women. And if they fall in love with them, they possess them. And there's... Seems kind of sexist. Can a woman jinn fall in love with a man? Uh, yeah, you know what? There's not a lot of focus on the gender of jinn from what I've found. I've seen... Oh, really? Are they genderless? I Honestly, I'm not sure. I didn't get that far in my research. Women are the fair sex. So I would understand if you're going to fall in love with... It would be a woman. Yeah. Well, it's like the Anunnaki, right? That idea. The fallen angels. Right. The interbreeding... The males find the human women yeah. attractive. Angel could be genderless and see a dude and be like, that's a hard no for me. I'm <laughs> a, a pass. pass. Human males are gross. <laughs> like Too much hair. So I found this story really entertaining and interesting. So let's do this one for our final story. So we will have in the show notes a lot of interesting information. Other stories I'll have linked in the show notes. May do a follow-up on this. Might even release some additional content because there's so much interesting stuff out there. So many stories and anecdotes. But let's do our final story for today, which is what I call tequiligen. To Kill a Jinn. Sounds like a... To Kill a Jinn Mockingbird. I'll link this in the show notes, guys, too, if you want to find the original post as well. So this poster telling a story starts by saying, Many things can harm a jinn. The most basic example is a human can use a jinn to harm another jinn. How does this happen? This is something he experiences in his village. One day, while in his village, he notices some very wealthy traffic at his neighbor's house. Expensive cars rolling up, people pulling in with Maseratis, Lamborghinis, visiting this guy in his very modest home, kind of poor fella. So it's eating at him. And about a week later, he gave into his curiosity, knocks on the door, 
and this old man answers. So thinking he might have recently lost someone and maybe these were people coming for a funeral, he asked if that's why people were coming to his house. What's going on? And the old man replied, No, they are my customers. What kind of customers? I asked. He invited me inside and offered me a cup of tea. He explains that he cures black magic incidents and problems of that nature. And the last one who visited him that had the Maserati was a guy whose daughter was going psycho all the time, shouting and breaking things. Her voice seemed to be changing, and so on. I said, How do you cure it? There are plenty of ways. If you don't have knowledge in magic and jinn, you can do it by reciting the Quran. And if the jinn is not Muslim, you most likely will convince him to leave the sick person alone. But if you're not reciting the Quran, then you come to me for my way of dealing with it. How, though? I can see and contact jinn. I can command them to do things. For example, right now, a jinn that I know is whispering to my mind that you're a businessman in Istanbul. Your mom's name is Dad's name is Your brother was affected by jinn five years ago because your mother accidentally peed when she gave... <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> yeah, it's a thing. I'll explain. Okay. Your brother was affected by jinn five years ago because your mother accidentally peed when she was giving birth to your young... <laughs> <laughs> what? It just sounds That's all it takes? In that voice, it sounds so funny. I'll explain it. I'll explain it. <laughs> all right, one more time. I know it's kind of distracting right now. Like, what is the deal with the pee? But I mean, I mean to say peed, too, like, I don't know. Urinated? Urinated yeah. would make Well, it's also, sense. this guy, it's not his first language, so English. We're kind of trying to work with the word. Can I do it one more time and say urinated so I don't laugh? Would that be better, do you think? Why well, you do it, we'll have both options. Your brother was affected by gin five years ago because your mother accidentally urinated. <laughs> <laughs> it's even better. It's just such a strange line. Yeah. Oh, I don't know if I'm able to do it. Uh. When she was giving birth to your brother, and there was a gin there by chance. He kept listing things he'd have no way of knowing. I was like, dude, what the fuck? How? He explained the details to me and said it's a harem thing to do because you can control a jinn by doing certain things. Apparently he was using the prophet Solomon's name to control them by saying, obey your master, etc. How do you cure them of it? I killed many jinns because most of them didn't want to leave my patient alone. So where I'm going is hell. How do you kill someone that you can't even see or feel? You use your jinn or your jinn army to kill that jinn. How do you convince them? I mostly don't even need to convince them anymore because the patient that is affected by black magic, he is mostly getting harm from a non-Muslim jinn, a demon, a bad one. The jinns that I'm friends with are fully Muslim, and I say in the name of Allah, save this Allah's follower from this kafir jinn. Do whatever is needed and save this innocent. Do it for Islam, do it for Allah. Later I found out many other hajjas do this in different ways, but this guy claimed this was his method. And I heard he was getting paid like ten to twenty thousand dollars or more. Hmm. First, I thought this guy's a liar, but then I believed him because Jen really exists. <laughs> that's great logic. Well, it is weird to see the car thing. I mean, I don't know how yeah, else would you explain? If that's that? a true story, if it's a true story, might be getting paid doesn't mean he's being. Well, there's a lot truthful. of gurus that are. It's weird that the guy is like, oh, I'm going to hell. <laughs> that is but interesting. The money's worth it while I'm here. Yeah, a lot, a lot of people <laughs> seem to think that. You know, that's true. Maybe he's tongue-in-cheek. Maybe he's hopeful that since he's doing some good for what people... What is it? You're just not allowed to kill anything? Is that the Well, I think it might reason? be that what he's doing is trying to bind a demon to his will. Maybe that's something you just, you're just you not supposed to do. Supposed to attempt, I don't it's know. It's not a demon, though. That's true. It's a jinn. I was thinking of Solomon. And it's not even like a bad jinn, apparently. He said, I killed many jinns, so where I'm going is hell. Unless it's a mistranslation and he's saying, I go to hell to do it. But I think, yeah, it sounds more like defeatist. I've decided this is what I do and I'm going to pay the price... Like it's also possible yeah. that he's a con artist and doesn't believe in any well, of it. Well, of course. We're just yeah. giving the benefit There's of There's a couple layers of separation on this story. So. <laughs> yeah. But so here's a follow-up on the pee thing. Yeah, what's going on with the pee? Uh, it's got to be pretty common. I have to pee I do too. Badly. I do too. But be careful in the bathrooms. Jins love bathrooms. It's an unclean place and God doesn't go there. Uh, so wait, 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 wait. God doesn't go to the Well, I don't I'm, I'm not quoting perfectly, but wish I would have known that when I was 12. The idea is the reason that dark places are dangerous and you should say a prayer before you go into like dark spaces or dirty places, these are things that jinn like to live. Mm -hmm. And God's I guess brightness can't shine as much there, something to that effect. So, but the pee thing, because that was confusing. 
this might have come from the same guy. I'll have to double check. This P thing I didn't see a lot of places, so just bear that in mind. So he says, Gins are all around you. When you look back, forward, right, left, restaurants, shops, streets, they can be anywhere. That's why it's very dangerous to pee outside. <laughs> Non-toilet places like woods don't. It's a danger. Or like throwing boiling water carelessly outside. That's a fairy thing, right? Yeah. You throw it out your window, that's potentially dangerous. Mm-hmm. You could land on a ferry or a Who throws gnome? boiling water out their window? Well, back in the day. Oh, this got too hot. If you didn't have a <laughs> sink indoors. Yeah, why is it boiling? You just cook something. Duh. You can't wait a minute? That's a good point. You could. You think it'd be safer for you as the thrower of the water. That's true. Moving along. Because if the unseen is there by chance, they get angry and play with you or harm you. This is so fairy-like. Uh, Some people will say, I peed in the woods billions of times. Yeah, me too. I peed too. Billions. But that just means you got luck on your side. <laughs> that you didn't pee on a gin. A friend of mine peed outside in the woods, and it turned out gins were right there eating dinner, literally like humans. He suddenly saw thousands of them. Some has only one arm, some no leg, kind of figures. It's their choice for you to be able to see them in what shape since they can turn matter to energy and back to matter. That's like the story that you're doing the expansion about the guy in the military who saw this gin. He had like picked up his arm and shook it at the guy like a proboscis. It's really interesting. So they got angry at my friend for peeing on him and made him walk 10 kilometers barefoot on the highway. His friends were with him and thought he had gone insane. He lost his mind saying, quote, I have to, it's my punishment. I peed. Stuff like that. By the way, I'm not trying to scare anyone. It's just real life, but Allah closed the curtains so we don't see them. The veil we talked about. People who want to see can easily see, by the way. It's not hard. It's just very dangerous. So that's that Hmm. guy's perspective. That's a pretty, not too bad of a punishment for peeing on a gin. Yeah, just a walk 10 kilometers. It's weird you pee and then there's just thousands of them. Like, that's a big dinner. Yeah. There's a lot of people eating at once. I was thinking that too. It's like a reunion, (laughs) a picnic. I just read an article in 40 and Times about this child who sees what she calls tree people, but they're shadows that live in uh-huh. the trees and run. It just kind of reminds just like me. Jin. Maybe that is what the glimmer man is. It's definitely possible. I mean, yeah. I mean, all this, so many overlaps. And people in the Muslim faith, that aligns with exactly their idea of what this is. They're the trickster. They play the role of whatever you want to see them as, but it's the ultra terrestrial. I think from what I understand, they don't believe as much in ghosts and the paranormal, that kind of stuff so much as it's all gin. Yeah. You hear me? You love pulling all the darkness into my house. Sorry, I just find it fascinating. Yeah, you get to go home. No, I'm joking. The last time we did do the skinwalker stuff, though, that mm-hmm. was when the whistle thing happened. Oh, the whistle ghost, yeah. Oh, that's a weird synchronicity, too. The story I don't have, it'll be in the show notes, was a kid who heard his dad whistling, always whistles while he smokes his pipe, goes down to like talk to him, and nobody's there. It's just reminded me of the disembodied voices. Oh, and Tim Marchenko, yeah. Impersonators, imposter entities, the gin, trickster. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. He mentions the gin in that book. Hopefully you won't have one in your house, John. <laughs> well, guys, if you enjoyed that, stick around or sign up if you're not a member for the expansion. Yes! Yeah. Go to beliefful.com, click on the big red sign up for the expansion button. Access granted. And we'll get into more creepy stories, wartime experiences with the paranormal, supernatural, maybe some more gin. Yeah, but definitely some monsters at war from different places around the world and different conflicts. Pretty interesting accounts. Should be, should be cool. And get some George H.W. action. Yeah, it's going to be. <laughs> Quick shout out. We've been working with an artist, Fancy Crafts. Fancy Crafts. Fancy Crafts. On YouTube. It's really good. Just check out his channel. It'll be a link in the show notes. Actually, if you want to learn to draw, it's actually really good. And he's got a real, it's almost like ASMR reminds me of. It's just a nice voice teaching you and showing you how to do it. I just wanted to get that shout out because like us on YouTube, YouTube just smashes creators down. There's no visibility. Unless you're CNN. CNN or ABC or Buzz BuzzFeed. Baloney. So he's got so little subscribers, a handful for what he does. I so just wanted check to say it it's not just illustration. His interests are obviously because he's a listener of our show. Oh, right. In the same vein as you guys out there. So you might find his uh, videos on um, fairies and then how to draw them or UFO Disclosure. UFO Disclosure. He's got a really great video. Really for interesting it. video about that. So check it out. Yay! All right, guys. Thank you so much. Leave reviews wherever you can if you can't sign up to be a member. Um, we love you. And we got to run because we all have to pee in the gin bathroom, apparently. Stay tuned. We will do another live stream at some point in the near future. Yeah, we'll announce that, guys. So. All right. All right, guys. We will see you next time on The Belief. The Belief. The Belief. The Belief. The Belief. The